Toronto, Canada's largest city and one of the most multicultural cities in the world. And as the world faces huge environmental challenges, a collaborative approach is being called for to address our shared environmental problems at regional and global levels. And that's the transboundary theme of this year's annual meeting, Great Together, Separate Challenges and Collective Solutions. It's the SeaTac North America 40th Annual Meeting, and you're watching SeaTac TV. Welcome back to the Metro Toronto Convention Centre and day two of the SeaTac North America 40th Annual Meeting. From endocrine disruptors to microplastics, this is the place to be to hear different disciplines discussing how we can tackle some of the environment's biggest challenges. And here on SeaTac TV, we'll be bringing you the very latest from the meeting and beyond. Today, we'll be taking a trip around the world as we hear about research being conducted off the beaten path. Plus, we'll be speaking to Kate Harris, one of Canada's top modern day explorers. And of course, hearing about some of the science being discussed here at the meeting. First though, I caught up with award-winning author and keynote speaker, Kate Harris. Well, award-winning travel writer Kate Harris is one of the keynote speakers here at the meeting and I'm delighted that she joins us now. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, it's lovely to have you here. Um, you're one of the keynote speakers, but I know that you'll be talking a little bit about your book which came out last year, um, Lands of Lost Borders, Journey on the Silk Road. Tell us a little bit about what the book's about, how it came about. Tell us more. Sure, yeah. So the book, um, it's about a bike trip on the Silk Road that I took with my best childhood friend, Melissa. Um, but even more than that, it's, it's um, a kind of an exploration of how borders of all kinds shape and, and shatter our world. And also an exploration of exploration itself. You know, this, this sort of basic impulse we have to figure out what in the universe we're doing here. I know there's some footage and we're going to see some of that very shortly, but I've watched it and it's an incredible journey. I mean, you went through some really extreme environments. That must have been really testing. It was intense, yeah. And at certain moments, we longed to be back home in our cozy beds. Um, but at the same time, there was, there was nothing else I wanted to be doing with my life or, or in the world at that point. Um, so that kind of kept us going. And um, you must have come across all sorts of different people, different communities. Tell us a bit about those. Yeah, the most phenomenal aspect of the trip by far was um, meeting people along the way and being met with such incredible warmth and generosity and, and kindness at every turn. Um, you know, we were traveling through countries that people only hear bad things about in the news, you know, all the stands. And uh, on the ground, the reality is really different. And that's one of the beauties of bike travel is that it, it makes you uh, move through a place in a really intimate, exposed way. And, and the, the, the flip side, the joy of that is, um, yeah, meeting all kinds of people you wouldn't meet otherwise because you're, you're off the beaten track. Um, and they also seem to respect you more because you show up on a, on a bicycle having clearly exerted yourself to get there. Um, so it's not like rolling in on a tour bus and um, stepping off with your, you know, your camera around your neck. Well, I know we've got some footage that we're going to look at now. Tell us what bit you wanted us to see. So we're going to see a little bit of footage from Tajikistan, which was probably my favorite stretch of the trip. Um, it's the most mountainous country in the world and uh, also one of the poorest countries in the world. And yet people are so incredibly generous there and kind. Um, it borders Afghanistan, China, um, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, and not many people have heard of the place, so it's really fun to share what it's like. Great, let's have a look.
Oh, Kate, okay. thank you for sharing that with us. That was brilliant to see. Now, as I said earlier, you're here as a keynote speaker. What are you going to be talking, without giving too much away, what will you be talking about? <laughs> um, the big themes of the book, mostly. So around you know, my uh, misadventures, exploring the edges of things from nations to endurance to my own sanity at times. Um, and a few of the encounters with, with borders, especially contested borderlands, that really you know, I went into with certain stereotypes about or um, expectations for what I'd see and, and ended up coming away with a very different picture of what, what's going on in these places where uh, we've built really intense walls. So I'll be talking, yeah, about all of that sounds, in 40 sounds, minutes. Sounds fantastic. Um, I think we're all dying to know though, just to finish off, what's next? What have you got planned next? Um, well, the latest adventure has been uh, living off grid in a tiny cabin yeah. um, on the border of BC, Alaska, and the Yukon, uh, where daily life really is an adventure. It's like being on a bike trip in that, you know, anything inessential in that small space. I live in less than 200 square feet with my partner. Um, anything inessential is just a burden. And so you really learn to pare down um, and, you know, you step out the door and there's, there's sort of mountains and rivers in all directions and uh, incredible landscapes to explore and also a really amazing community that I'm a part of. So just learning how to live off grid, live close to the land. Um, and I've also been learning how to fly a plane, which has always been a dream of mine. I, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid. Um, so this is my version of a very low earth orbit. Yeah. Wonderful, well, it all sounds really exciting. Will we see another book, do you think? Definitely, yeah, I've just, I've just gotten the next uh, book deal for the, the, my future book, which does not yet exist, but uh, it'll be about living off grid and learning to fly and uh, kind of wanderlust gone local. You know, it's so easy to be amazed by the world when you sort of catapult yourself into another country and everything is different and you're, you're woken up by that. Um, but how can we bring that same uh, vibrancy of, of attention and awakeness to everyday life wherever we are? So that's what I'm exploring. Fantastic. Well, watch this space. We will be looking forward to it. Thanks <laughs> Thank so you. much for joining us, Kate. My pleasure. And we'll have more tales of adventure from around the world later on in the show. Shortly, we'll be heading to Japan to take a look at the work of the Center for Health and Environmental Risk Research. First, though, let's have a quick taster of all the in-depth features that you can catch all week here on SeaTac TV. The NIES is the leading institute of environmental science in Japan. And our center, uh, Center for Health and Environmental Risk Research, is in charge of uh, scientific research to help realize uh, safe and secure societies. The center conducts research on uh, development of advanced ecotoxicity testing, analytical chemistry for environmental monitoring, environmental fate analysis and modeling, and exposure and risk assessment. The center also conducts research on environmental health research field on the uh, impact of chemicals on the human health by toxicology and epidemiology. The center consists of uh, researchers from a variety of backgrounds. Those include chemistry, biology, mathematical sciences, environmental engineering, toxicology, and epidemiology. We developed a GIS-based uh, multimedia environmental fate model that covers uh, whole Japan with very fine uh, geographical resolution. The model can simulate environmental level distribution of chemicals over Japan uh, in each river segment. The model is now a major tool of Japanese official uh, chemical risk assessment. My area of expertise is to develop environment fate models and emission estimation methods for chemicals, including environmental risk assessment based on these results. I developed the pesticide chemicals high resolution estimation method named PECREM. It is used for estimating spatially and temporary variable emissions of various party pesticides. We are also developing the grid catchment integrated environmental modeling system named GSIMS. The GSIMS model is multimedia fate model. 
It was basically developed for simulating organic pollutants. It has multi major compartments such as atmosphere, soft soil layer, river and lakes, sea, and sediment with high spatial resolution. Anyone can download this model together with a user interface tool and input dataset for whole Japan from our website. The model can show concentration maps and environmental concentration distributions, including these temporal trends for each medium. The importance of effective and efficient risk assessment is increasing because many new chemicals are produced day by day. It will be more important to grasp the environmental levels of each chemical in low cost. I think multimeter fate model like GCM's model and emission estimation method are key technologies to achieve this goal. We are working on the development of new testing method for ecotoxicity of chemicals. Uh, one of them is a Meogurt method for uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals and uh, uh, transgenerational impacts. My interest is in uh, ecotoxicity and ecological risk assessment of environmental contaminants such as pharmaceuticals, surfactants, and pesticides. We collaborated with the US EPA to develop Medaka extended one generation reproduction test, which was approved as OECD test guideline number 2450. This method takes almost six months, but has the extremely high sensitivity to detect the maternal transfer of the chemical and reproductive effects. The flow through system was built to maintain the concentration of the chemicals to conduct the long-term fish toxicity testing. All the instruments are made of stainless steel, glassware, and PTFE to avoid the background contamination by the plasticizers, which is suspected as endocrine disruptors. We have contributed to the chemical management in Japan, such as chemical substances control law by the supply of testing organisms, such as fishes, crustaceans, and aquatic plants. Another important achievement is the new introduction of comprehensive analytical schemes in variety of applications of environmental monitoring. I am conducting research on grasping hazardous chemical substances in the environment by integrating chemical analysis and bioassays. I also conduct research on environmental monitoring methods to be used when chemical substances leak during the disaster. AIQS, called AICS, stands for Automatic Identification and Quantification System. AICS enables the identification and semi-quantification of substances without the use of target standards by adjusting the GCMS conditions. In addition to about 1,000 substances that can be measured at present, we are updating the database so that more substances can be measured. The molecularly imprinted polymers, MIP, we are developing, mimics nuclear receptor such as estrogen receptor. Once this MIP is completed, it will be possible to efficiently extract and purify estrogen receptor binding substances from environmental water. In parallel with this, we have just started the development of MIP that collects silent hormone receptor binding substances. In the future, we hope to be able to build a system that can detect environmental changes and identified environmental impact contaminants rapidly. We will pursue the upgrade of ecotoxicity testing methods and investigation on the environment using several assays. We will also continue working on bioinformatics to contribute to the development of AOP and IATA. Our center will try our major effort to establish innovative science that supports society for sound and safe use of chemicals in the world. Here 
here at the SeaTac North America annual meeting, the 40th anniversary celebrations are really taking center stage. It's a time to reflect on the past, take stock of the many achievements and look to the future. And that's exactly what's happening today in this special spotlight session, which is happening in the hall behind me. So let's go and hear some more. I think the future um, for the society reflects um, sort of the, the trend that we're seeing in, in science and in scientific publishing in general. And that is openness, transparency, collaboration, and really a, a, a shared dialogue between three very important um, uh, camps of science. Our business community, our governmental authorities, our academicians and professional scientists. Um, CTAC is a unique organization in that open, collaborative, sharing uh, world of science. I'm delighted to be joined now by Elaine Dorwood King, former CTAC president and also one of the co-chairs of the 40th anniversary Spotlight session. Elaine, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us just very briefly, what do you think this 40th anniversary means to CTAC? Well, CTAC was founded because the because we recognize that we wouldn't be able to solve environmental problems unless we work together as scientists across the natural boundaries between academia, government, business, between chemists and toxicologists. And so 40 years is a wonderful time to reflect on where we've been, how far we've come, but also, as we tried to do in our session this morning, look to the future. Where, what, where are we going? Where do we want to be in 40 years? And what did come out this session, where do you want to be in 40 years? Well, one of the interesting things that came up this morning was how, how can we continue to make sure that the science that most of the members of CTEC are engaged in, you know, un uh, understanding our environment better, understanding the impacts of chemicals and, and humanity on the environment, how can we make sure that that's used in a way that's relevant for decision makers in the future. Because often scientists and the language that we speak is different from the language that managers or decision makers, whether they're in government or, or industry, you know, and that's the language they, they, they speak. And if we are gonna ensure that CTEC is as relevant 40 years from now, as it has been in the past 40 years in informing those decision makers on how we make the world a better place, we have to think about that. Now, flame retardants play a vital role in stopping fires and saving people's lives, but what are their environmental footprint? Well, we've been along to ICL Group to take a look at their innovative approach to reducing that footprint. ICL is a global fertilizer and a specialty chemical company. It's one of the uh, largest flame retardant uh, producers. Uh, we make brominated uh, flame retardants, uh, phosphorus-based flame retardants, and inorganic flame retardants uh, based on magnesium. The primary source of minerals for ICL is from the Dead Sea. It's rich in minerals, so it's rich in bromine, and then we also make uh, derivatives based on bromine near the Dead Sea in Israel. Flame retardant chemicals are additives which you add to combustible materials. It can be a natural material like wood, paper, or to the plastics. And these chemicals, 
they prevent ignition of the combustible materials or they help to limit spread of the fire. They use mostly in electronics, in building materials, in textiles, transportation. We're surrounded by materials which are very flammable and we need to protect them. The values of developing sustainable products is important from the early stage, from the discovery stage, as we use these chemi green chemistry principles, uh, develop products that are more sustainable, environmentally friendly, and also processes that become sustainable and environmentally friendly. ICL's approach to dealing with materials like flame retardants is fairly unique in that they have not only constructed materials and taken, you know, some effort to look at the impacts of their products, but they've actually taken a, an umbrella approach at designing and developing tools and an infrastructure to help customers evaluate what of the, the product choices for different applications. And I find that very, very unique in the industry to be actually you know, reaching out to the customer and providing tools to help assess the different possibilities and different choices. The SAFE is a tool that takes into account all the health, safety and environmental properties of a product. And it also takes into account the exposure profile of the intended application. And what it seeks to do is to match up the exposure against the health, safety, environmental properties so you can select the most appropriate flame retardant. It takes into account the price, it takes into account the properties that you require and make sure that the end consumer is protected and gets the most suitable product. From the green chemistry perspective, looking at the safer tool that ICL has, right now it is focused pretty much on the types of products that ICL sells. I see that general approach being applicable to a much broader industrial audience, and I hope that in the future we see ICL's you know, tools and methodologies find its way into different industry sectors, because I think it's a very, very useful approach. By developing new flame retardants, which are polymeric, big molecules by nature, or reactive molecules, which will react with the matrix where they stay, uh, we believe, strongly believe, that these molecules will stay where they are. They will not escape into the environment, and this will significantly decrease environmental footprint of flame retardants. ICL is working very hard toward low chemical uh, our environmental footprint and to provide sustainable products. So for example, we have a new uh, flame retardant Polyquel P100. It's a flame retardant for electronic applications. We can make that compound using solvent-free process. We cut the cost of this product and this product is also low in uh, chemical footprint. So I think this product is very beneficial to both uh, uh, our uh, producer and also uh, our customers. Yeah, at ICL we're very focused on the circular economy. Safer is just one part of what we're doing. In Europe we have a plant now which is actually recycling insulation foam and it's allowing the styrene to be recovered and to remake polystyrene and we recover the bromine and we can make other bromine compounds from that. If you make the right selection of flame retardants in your product, then they will be suitable to be recycled once, twice, three times, as many as you need. And circular economy is undoubtedly the future for the plastics industry. The vision is to work across boundaries and develop products that are useful and also sustainable. From the perspective of a practicing chemist, ICL has a, a leadership role it's playing in flame retardants, specifically because of this the SAFER program that they've generated that helps customers evaluate different product options and weigh them against pluses and minuses in performance and safety. And I see that as having no peers in the industry for that kind of a program. Well, one of the hot topics at this year's meeting, and indeed for a number of years, has been endocrine disruptors. And I'm delighted now to be joined by Heiko Schoenfuss, who's going to have a chat with us about them. Heiko, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. 
Can you tell us first of all, for anyone that doesn't know, what we're talking about when we talk about endocrine disruptors? Sure, endocrine disruptors are really a, a subclass of pollutants in the environment that have a very particular form of action. They interact with the endocrine system, hence the name, and can very subtly change uh, the mode of an organism's normal functioning. And can you give us some examples of the types of substances that we're yes. talking about? A lot of those are things that can mimic a hormone. Uh, so for example, the estrogen hormones that drive a lot of reproductive behaviors. We have found over the last 20 or so years that there are a number of compounds in the environment that actually will mimic a naturally occurring estrogen. And so an organism will not be able to distinguish between the naturally occurring estrogen produced by the organism and compounds in the environment that mimic them. And one of the results can be, for example, that male fish develop female reproductive organs, so a form of intersex that has been quite a bit covered in the media. And are there any other effects that we're seeing on wildlife, or is that sort of the main effect? It's probably the one that has been most publicized over the years, but there's certainly other effects as well. We have some pesticides that may feminize uh, female fish and make them more masculine, um, or we have chemicals that feminize male fish and make them more female. Um, so there's a whole range of compounds and one of the things we really grapple with is the total universe of endocrine disrupting chemicals and trying to distinguish between an endocrine disrupting effect and just a general pollutant effect on an organism. So where are we with that understanding? Well we're getting closer. Uh, we have had 20 years to try to understand what endocrine disruptors do and how do we distinguish between an endocrine disrupting effect on an organism, again usually mediated through the steroid systems, the endocrine system of the body, and those effects that are really just stressors from environmental pollutions. But we are now at a point where the regulatory agencies are really trying to firm up that understanding and create mechanisms to distinguish between those two forms of pollutant stress. So what do you think are the solutions to, to this? One of the advantages of dealing with endocrine disrupting compounds, many of them are produced and used in households. So we can personally take responsibility. And so education has been a big part of trying to deal with the problem. If you reduce the use of certain compounds, you may be able to reduce the adverse effect in the environment. In other cases, it might be green chemistry, replacing compounds, or just finding better ways to uh, develop industrial solutions to minimize compound use. And do you think this is a problem that's being taken seriously enough at the moment? I believe so. There has been a lot of interest in endocrine disruption work, uh, both in the public and in the scientific community. I think it exceeds CTAC as a, as a venue. We are probably one of the leading organizations to deal with endocrine disruption, but there's a lot of public interest in it, and there's regulatory interest, which is very important as well. well Thank you so much for joining us, Heiko. Really fascinating to hear about it. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Let's go over now to Procter & Gamble and take a look at their innovation leadership. Procter & Gamble has a long history of innovation. It serves about 5 billion consumers with personal care and consumer care products globally. We have a long, long history of innovation in the personal and care space. We've been working on animal alternatives since the 1970s. In the environmental safety area, this is a relatively new question, one that really began to form in its present shape around the 2000s. This is now a consumer need. It's a societal desire and we've invested very, very significantly in trying to devise assays that can address these questions. Safety is at the heart of everything we do. Safety is really three parts. It's objective safety, it's perceived safety, and it's regulatory safety. And we do our best to make sure that we are advancing the science and that we're being transparent and we're being good communicators with the science so we can assure the public that we're doing our best and that we really understand the compounds and the risks associated with them. The consumer expect our products to be safe, and we also must make them safe for the environment as well. P&G has a long and storied history in really advancing the field of environmental safety and risk assessment, and I've been drawn to really practical applications of trying to advance the science. We build the basic foundational science to advance this work. Procter & Gamble works with scientists from academia, across industry, and scientists with, within government as well. This so-called tripartite approach is fundamental to making progress 
in defining what safe means and the data behind making safety determinations. Over the years, my work with Procter & Gamble has been in a variety of areas. We started out in the mid-90s working on different experimental techniques and experimental designs to provide better testing for effluents and chemicals. And then through the 2000s, we've worked with PNG on better experimental designs, better tests. In the effort to be more sustainable and to reduce animal needs for testing, this is something that we all have to work with together. This isn't just something that P&G does on its own. This is a partnership with government, with academia, with other industries, in order to understand the science that's needed to replace animal tests. But we can't do this in a vacuum. We need to have our tripartite partnership in order to make sure that we are developing a robust environmental safety assessment and that what we are developing is something that everyone agrees is safe and is repeatable and is reliable. It doesn't mean a lot coming from just me. It means a lot more coming from our regulator partners and coming from our academic partners as well. We have always been interested in devising assays that are more informative than the ones that we presently use. And in animal alternatives research, this is no different. The fish embryo test, or FET, is an animal replacement assay. It uses developmental endpoints that are tied directly to whether the fish will survive later on as a juvenile in development. PNG uses alternative methods like the fish embryo toxicity test to understand the environmental hazard of compounds. We can use this test and the results from it in order to guide business development and make sure that we are moving towards a more sustainable and safe space. And we can also use this information in our product registration and environmental risk assessments. The future of animal alternative assays is actually very exciting. There are many things that are on the horizon that will improve what we can do for predicting environmental safety. With fish and animal alternatives, with people in Procter & Gamble and HESI and other organizations, really I think has done a lot to help the world understand how to do assessments and protect the environment in a ethical and meaningful way that provides safety and science-based decisions on how to do work in the environment. We're often um, sought after for our ability to partner with our analytical capabilities. People will think of P&G and say, I want to collaborate with P&G because they have world-class toxicologists and they have this incredible chemistry associates that they can work with as well. And they're just right down the hall from us. So when we're developing a test, I can have those conversations with chemists and then we can have the conversations from the testing side of things. And together we can work to build a phenomenal testing strategy that leads to robust data generation for our risk assessments. If not for CTAC and its tripartite relationships with government, academia, and industry, we would be in very different place than we are right now. My collaboration with partners in industry and in government have really helped the environment in meaningful ways. We can do so much more together than we can alone, and for sure, CTAC has been an instrumental part of shaping environmental safety sciences today. We consider ourselves leaders in the field and we continue to work to help shape the right ways to answer the most important questions. Well, earlier in the show, we met one of Canada's top modern day explorers. And now joining us in the SeaTac TV studio, I'm delighted to be joined by three very intrepid scientists. Thank you all, Ross, Kim, and Katrina for joining us, thank you. So let me start by asking all of you, Ross, I'll start with you. Tell us a little bit of a resume about the kind of work you do, the kind of places you go to. Well, I do aquatic sciences um, in the tropics, pretty much globally. So it started by, I'm Australian and I, I was trained in the tropics. And then the first job that I managed to get finishing my PhD was in Papua New Guinea. So that then just started the, the story of my life from that point. So since then worked pretty much globally in the tropics. Um, and what is it about kind of working globally in those sorts of locations that appeals to you? Oh, the, the cultural diversity is amazing uh, and just the diversity of foods as well. But you get to see ecosystems uh, that you wouldn't see in your own space, in your own country. You get to work with people who live in those ecosystems. So 
it's just uh, an amazing total experience. Katrina, how about you? Tell us the sort of work and places you've been. Yeah, well, I'm from Norway, so as one of the Nordic Arctic countries, uh, I've been working a lot up in the Arctic. Uh, and that is seen as a pristine environment. We do, we do uh, find contaminants there. So uh, we have a long line of research there. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in how contaminants end up there and how they are accumulated in the aquatic food webs. And Kim, what about you? Tell us about um, Well, I'm Canadian and so and I work for the Environment Canada. So I've been working here in Canada, um, anywhere from urban centres here with peregrine falcons breeding in the buildings right around here on the tops to the north shore of Lake Superior. I've been fortunate to work out in the oil sands and now most recently I'm working up um, in the Arctic. So I've met Katrina that way and we don't have any tropical ecosystems here but as as Ross said I've, I've really enjoyed seeing the diversity of beautiful landscapes I just normally wouldn't see and yeah and meeting some really wonderful people too. There must be quite a number of unique challenges that you face um, what sort of challenges do you face Ross any any that come to mind? Uh, I mean most of it's a challenge because you're often working very remotely there's the facilities that you normally expect to have just aren't available uh, modern technology is helping you take stuff with you, but you know, when I started you'd get dropped out of a helicopter in the middle of a rainforest somewhere with nothing but a notebook and, and what you needed to get the, the job done with. So communication has really changed over the years. But just dealing with the circumstances of having to problem solve where you are because you can't go to a shop and buy something that you forgot. And, and the climatic and environmental environment must be very difficult as well. Of course, it adds an extra constraint when you work in a cold and at parts of the time very dark environment. But I've also been working in Africa recently, working on e-waste. And I have to say that it's quite challenging to work there as well, even if we're working close to urban sites, because you, you meet a whole other range of uh, challenges than we meet in the Arctic. And Kim, you must have come across a number of challenges too. Well, I think I've been somewhat lucky with um, some of my work down in s southern Canada, I'll say, where, you know, if you forget something, usually you can go to the local hardware store and pick up whatever simple fieldwork equipment you need. But going up to the Arctic where you're, you know, you've got a fly-in plane and you're there for a month, it's like you have to make sure you've got everything. Uh, you're, you know, hoping that the weather holds when you are going to fly in and fly out and that. So, yes, there are challenges for sure. You must, I mean, you wouldn't do this type of work if you didn't love it. It must give you a real buzz, presumably. Yeah, yes. I think, yeah, the, two of the biggest buzzes I get is actually being in the, in the field with the animals. But, and then, funny enough, getting my um, publications accepted. I, get, I still get a buzz from that. Yeah. It's like, oh, good news. <laughs> But I also think that when, you, um, especially in the Arctic, we see that the work we do directly feeds into international uh, regulations, yes. and that is also an extra motivation. Yes. And that's something I'm thinking about when I'm standing there freezing and uh, waiting yes. for that is so <laughs> whatever rewarding, animal isn't it? I'm going to look at. Yeah. 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 I wonder if we could just um, talk very quickly, just to finish as well, just from all of you. One of the, I know one of the values of CTAG is um, bringing younger people on, helping students get into work. For anyone that's watching this and hearing you and thinking, like, really, that's the kind of path I want to follow, maybe have you all got a bit of advice for us, anything? That... Well, I stumbled into my pathway, so I don't know that serendipity is a recommendation for a career path. Uh, but certainly being open to, to opportunities when they come, that's the, the key thing, isn't yeah. it? Take whatever chance comes your way. If someone offers you something, even if you don't feel quite qualified enough for it, I tell my students, take it. You never know when that'll come up. And it's the same, any stage of your career, I would just say, take the opportunities when they present themselves. And I'd just say that to me, working for, and, and joining SeaTac from a very remote part of the world, that the network SeaTac gave yeah. me was so crucial to being able to keep up to the science, and to connect with people to solve problems. Yeah. And don't be afraid to, to reach out and, uh, and contact people because most people are very friendly and really eager to help and uh, give you advice. Yeah, and I would echo what Ross yeah. said. Um, CTAC has opened up some amazing opportunities for me. I've met some wonderful people through them and collaborators. And I think that's open to anyone and everyone. Um, students for all levels. Well, we'll have to end it there, but thank you all of you for joining us from your various corners of the world and enjoy the rest of the meeting.
Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of our second programme here on SeaTac TV, and it's been a fantastic day. We've loved hearing more about the 40th anniversary celebrations, meeting some really intrepid travellers, and also discussing endocrine disruptors. Do join us again tomorrow when we'll be meeting an award winner and talking about PFAS. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>